Hey guys, Kenny here. So today I wanted to kind of talk to you about using water sustainably. I don't want this to take up too much time. We've talked about a lot of these tips, hints, tricks, uh, things you can do already. So I just want to reiterate some of the steps you can take to help be more sustainable in your water use. So number one, how can we irrigate more sustainably? Number two, how can you reduce freshwater use in your home? Number three, how can gray water help with our water use? Now we've talked since the very first unit when we we're looking at sustainability about the idea of trade-offs. There are going to be advantages and disadvantages to a lot of the decisions that we as humans have to make with respect to our natural resources. And water is no different. So when we start thinking about withdrawing groundwater, okay, when we start thinking about drilling wells, when we start thinking about using this instead of using our surface water, what are the benefits? One, if we do that, it's really useful for drinking and irrigation and available year round. We don't have to worry about frozen above ground water, ice, these types of things. And it exists almost everywhere. If it's not over pumped or contaminated, we can use it as a renewable water source because it will be recharged <clears throat> by surface water because remember the two feed into each other. And because it's below ground, we don't see the evaporation that we do of surface water. And in many cases, it's much cheaper to extract than most surface waters. However, there are some disadvantages as well. This can lead to aquifer depletion and subsidence from overpumping. Uh, aquifer is polluted for decades or centuries because remember, they don't self-clean very well. You can end up with saltwater intrusions, especially if you're in coastal areas. Think about a case study when we start looking at um, salt, right? Seeping into the water table, or the aquifer in the LA County, LA Basin region. We can start seeing reduced flows into surface waters and an increased cost and contamination from deeper wells. Because a lot of times if your well starts to run out, what's the answer? To get deeper, right? So what are the sort of things that we can go ahead and do to help with groundwater? One, waste less water. Uh, use only water when you need it. We need to subsidize water conservation, not water prices. Okay? Water is incredibly cheap. And so it's easy for us to forget about it and waste it. Limit the number of wells that we have and don't grow water intensive crops in dry areas. I mean. Uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, you know, we start looking at California, Arizona. These places were not meant to be big bread baskets where they grew a whole bunch of high water need plants. So what kind of controls can we put in place? Raise the price of water to discourage waste. Nobody likes paying more, but if you do, you'll probably value that resource more. And I think that's, that's what's going to happen in the future. Okay, yes, we have desalination that they're looking at and some of those potential options to provide us with more fresh water. But as of right now, there are still downsides. It's still expensive. We still have to deal with the brine that's produced. So we, we have to think about where our water is coming from. And, and the best way to hit most people is through their pocketbook. We need to tax water pumped from wells near surface waters because those surface waters are seeping into those wells. And so that's replenishing it. And there, those people are taking that water before it has a chance to get into the main aquifer. We need to set and enforce minimum stream flow levels. If we do that, then we won't over pump from a particular stream, which means it's going to be there longer for us, which is much more sustainable and then divert surface water in wet years to recharge our aquifers so that we don't constantly deplete the groundwater supply. So if there's more water, that doesn't mean use more water. That means use the same amount of water and put that water into the aquifer to keep us going for years in the future. So by reducing waste, raising prices, slowing population growth and protecting ecosystems that store water naturally, we can use available fresh water much more sustainably for many years to come. One of the biggest ones is to reduce freshwater losses. And more than half of the world's freshwater supply is lost annually, every single year, due to evaporation and inefficient use. 
And one of the biggest offenders in this is irrigation. Why? Because government subsidies and underpricing of water make it cheap, make it easy for the farmers to get as much as they want so they're not careful about how they're using it. There are a lack of subsidies for efficient water use. And if we can make water use more efficient and benefit those who are willing to make the sacrifice to be more efficient in their water use, those costs will balance out and more and more people will become efficient because that's what's going to save them money. So one of the best things we can do is switch to modern irrigation methods, drip, central pivot, which are going to be heavily reduced in terms of their freshwater losses. Maybe when you went by a big field that was growing something, you saw something like this, right? <clears throat> These types of sprinkler systems waste a whole bunch of water that gets evaporated off before it ever gets used by the plants. Super inefficient. Maybe you saw fields that get watered like this, where you just kind of let it run. When that happens, you again see a lot of evaporation. Some of it flows too fast for the crops to actually take up and is lost, making it easier to cause soil erosion, making it easier to take things like pesticides and fertilizer to other locations. So we really need to focus on efficient irrigation technologies. And it turns out that traditional irrigation methods, which rely on gravity and flowing water, um, are not necessarily the best way to go. Okay? Newer systems such as drip irrigation in the middle and center pivot irrigation with sprinklers on the right are far more efficient and reduce water loss. Especially, I, I, I feel very fondly about drip irrigation and I think it has a lot of potential benefits. And I especially think places like orchards could benefit tremendously from this because their efficiency is in the 90 to 95% range consistently. Whereas your gravity flow systems, which are still really common and popular, tend to be somewhere between 60 and 80 at best. Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, there's gotta be incentive to get people to change from what they've been doing. If we want more efficient methods, we need to make them understand in the pocketbook what the cost is in the long term. So what can we do? Number one thing, number one thing when it comes to irrigation, avoid growing thirsty crops in dry areas. What's a thirsty crop? Thirsty crop is a crop that requires a lot of water. We think about something like uh, <clears throat> almond. Almond milk is a big thing right now, right? But we grow a lot of our almond milk, our almonds for almond milk in fields where it's a dry area and we're pumping in a lot of water. That's not in our agroecology that we've been talking about. Okay. That is using way too much water input. Um, we tend to import a lot of water intensive crops and meat. What should we do instead? Uh, we need to encourage organic farming and polyculture to retain soil, soil moisture. Uh, we need to monitor soil moisture and add water only when it's needed. Expand the use of drip irrigation and other efficient methods. Irrigate at night to reduce evaporation. If the sun's not there, it's not going to be as hot. You're going to lose less water. Line our canals that bring water to irrigation ditches so that you lose less of that water seeping uh, into soil that's not going to go ahead and use it. And irrigate with treated wastewater. Well, it's treated so it's clean and the levels of treatment are lower than if they were for drinking water. So we can use this at lower cost and still provide a very high quality product. <clears throat> and while I am constantly talking about the fact that this type of conservation and sustainability starts with you, industries need to step up. They need to intensify their efforts to recycle the water that they use. You can do some of this too. So in your home, toilet flushing is the single largest use of domestic wa fresh water. Switch your toilet, install low flow toilets, shower heads, faucets. If you get a leak, fix it. Use a front loading washer, okay? Because then we tend to use less water when we do it. 
When you can, use gray water, drip, smart sprinkler systems on landscaping, or replace lawns with drought tolerant plants. <clears throat> we need to redesign our manufacturing processes to use less water, we just do. And if we can recycle the water that we do use in industry and not waste it by fixing leaks and things like that, if we're gonna have landscaping for our business or even our home, Make sure we use plants that require less water. Use drip irrigation on gardens and lawns. Use water saving shower heads, faucets, appliances, collect and reuse gray water. What's gray water you may be asking? Um, gray water is water that would be thrown away that isn't necessarily that bad. It may have some less clean things in it, but it's not dirty in the sense that it's contaminated, okay? When you go ahead and take a shower, most of you probably go ahead and let the water run until it's warm. Well, that's water that's clean going down the drain. You're just not using because it's not hot. If we put a bucket in there, collect that water, and then put that into the back of your toilet after you flush, now you're using it again rather than wasting it. Okay, that would be a good example of gray water. If you correct, collect rainwater and go ahead and water your plants with it, this is another great technique that you can do to go ahead and make yourself more sustainable. <clears throat> Flushing away industrial and household wastes with fresh water causes pollution and is unsustainable. Gray water and industrial wastewater from sewage treatment plants can be used to clean equipment, flush away waste, water lawns, and irrigate non-food crops. As we've mentioned before, last set of notes uh, earlier today, we need to find substitutes for toxic pollutants. If you can find something that does almost as good a job that's from a non-toxic, please think about switching. Remove hazardous waste before they reach sewage treatment plants. Use natural sewage treatment methods rather than using some sort of synthetic chemical to go ahead and treat the sewage. Reduce non-point sources of runoff, especially from agriculture that we've talked about. Slow population growth and reduce poverty. Eliminate air pollution because remember the air is tied to the water because of the water cycle. And encourage recycling and reuse of our resources. Now, I thought it'd be cool to look at one example of this, which is treating sewage by working with nature using what they call living machines. These are tanks with increasingly complex organisms that artificially go ahead and, well, not artificially, naturally go ahead and work through waste. We can create artificial wetlands that do similar filtration processes. This is one of the purposes of those little rain gardens you've seen kind of going in around town. Work with science to find scientific principles that can help us be sustainable. The environmental scientist Peter Montague is one that's pioneering some of these sewage treatment plants, and his goal is to remove toxic waste before the water goes into municipal sewage treatment plants. He wants to reduce or eliminate the use of waste or toxic chemicals by using things like compost toilet systems. He does what's known as a wetland-based sewage treatment system, and so he has natural water purification by diverting sewer water into a passive greenhouse, solar energy, that of the sun and natural processes from the plants, remove and recycle the nutrients. And it's a diverse or group of organisms that can be utilized here. But ultimately this can help us find ways to reuse the waste, grow things that could be beneficial and clean the water for reintroduction. The last thing that we wanna talk about a little bit is purifying our drinking water. If you want to improve our drinking water, right? We need to find ways to keep it clean. We tend to store our water in reservoirs temporarily, but if we're gonna keep it clean, we need to get clean coming in there. And that means to protect our forests and protect our wetlands because those watersheds, that's where the water's gonna go first before it gets to the reservoir. And the root systems of these plants is a great way to go ahead and help clean out the water. This can convert sewer water into drinking water. 
But we also have man-made processes like microfiltration, reverse osmosis. Yes, the same type of process, just different type of membrane that we saw when we were looking at desalination. And things like hydrogen peroxide and UV light, which can help us to clean drinking water. This is especially important for developed countries, which have the reservoir storage and we can utilize these plant purifications. But it's also important for developing countries that don't have these types of purification plants, right? Clear plastic bottle in the sun with black sides can help kind of cook out and kill any biologics that are in there. There has been the development of things like the life straw. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but essentially the life straw you can take this little tube. It's got a filtration system built into it. You can drink it straight out of the river and it takes out the impurities. Okay, Pretty cool. There's the website if you're interested in checking it out. Um, so we can reduce irrigation waste, line our canals, irrigate at night, monitor soil moisture. We've seen all these things before. These are not new. Encourage organic farming. Avoid growing water thirsty crops, irrigate with treated urban wastewater, import water intensive crops and meat rather than growing them in that particular area that would require a lot of water. This relates to that food miles discussion that we had before. Some things, the inputs are so heavy and costly to the environment, it's better to go ahead and ship them in instead. So if we can redesign our manufacturing processes to use less water, recycle wastewater from industry, landscape our yards with low water need plants, use drip irrigation, fix leaks, use water meters, raise water prices. I can't overemphasize that, you know, we just, we undervalue water. And one of the simplest things we could do to get the biggest change in human behaviors, make it more expensive. <clears throat> People will automatically stop wasting it as much. Use waterless composting toilets. Require water conservation in water short cities. We're going to have a, an article at some point here where we go ahead and talk about, or maybe it's in today's reading, when we go, uh, the Ed Puzzle. When we start looking at South Africa, Cape Town, South Africa was on the verge of cutting off water to everyone because of wasted water. The city was able to cut its water usage in half and didn't have to turn off the water. And that was just in two short years. So if people are pushed, they can do these things. Use water saving toilets, shower heads, front load clothes washers, collect and reuse household water to irrigate lawns, non-edible plants, purify and reuse water for houses, apartments, office buildings. There's lots of things we can do. But we just need to think about what we're using the water for. And I think, again, if the value was higher for water, fewer people will waste it. So waste less water, subsidize water conservation rather than water cost. Don't deplete our aquifers because that can damage our groundwater reservoirs for permanently. Protect our forests, wetlands, main, mountain glaciers, watersheds, these other systems that store and release water for us. If we deplete them too fast, that water is not going to be available in the future. And with things like climate change, glaciers are going to do less of a job of storing water, fresh water for the future. Get agreements among regions and countries sharing surface water resources. This is going to be a big deal. This is why desalination is becoming such a big point of concern and topic because rivers like the Nile River, um, well, that water is going to end up being really sought after. And you're already starting to see some hostility between countries like Ethiopia and Egypt over that water. So ultimately, slow the population and raise the water prices. Okay, guys, stay healthy, stay safe, take care of yourselves. I'll talk to you soon. So long.